welcome to the Global Roundtable, organized by South South News and the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Today we have the pleasure of the company of Mrs. Ambassador from Kenya, Mrs. Ajambo. Thank you so much for coming here. It's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you for having me here. So we'll start just reminding us about Kenya, a beautiful country on the eastern coast of Africa, named after the Mount Kenya, which is the second highest peak in Africa. It borders with Tanzania, Uganda, Sudan, Ethiopia, and Somalia, and it has a coast on the Indian Ocean. The area is around 580,000 square kilometers and the population around 41 million. The climate ranges from tropical on the coast to arid in the interior of the country. The terrain is low plains, central highlands, and fertile plateau. The highlands of Kenya are one of the most successful agricultural production areas in Africa. There are glaciers on Mount Kenya and there is an abundant wildlife. There are wonderful natural conditions, still only 8% of arable land. Median age of population is between 18 and 19 years, very young population. 22% of population is urban. The capital is Nairobi with 3.5 million inhabitants. Life expectancy is 59 years. The biggest natural resources of Kenya are limestone, soda ash, salt, gemstones, zinc, diatomite, gypsum, wildlife, and hydropower. There are many ethnic groups and religions. The official language is English and Kiswahili. The literacy is 85%. School life expectancy is 18 years. The economy is the largest economy in East and Central Africa. GDP grew at 5% in 2010, and GDP per capita is $1,600. 22% of the general production is agriculture, 16 is industry, and 62 services, mostly telecommunications. Agriculture is based particularly on tea, coffee and flowers that are internationally renowned, but also corn, sugarcane, fruit, vegetables, meat, dairy. Industry is mostly small-scale consumer goods industry, agricultural products and horticulture. There is some oil refining, aluminum steel, lead, ship repair and of course tourism. The exports, tea, flowers, coffee, petroleum products, fish and cement, mostly to United Kingdom, Netherlands, Uganda, Tanzania, and Pakistan. Kenya gained its independence in 1963. Its last constitution was drafted in 2010, and the current president is Mwai Kibaki. Mrs. Ambassador, we have tried to describe your country in general, objective terms. Would you like to give us a brief description by yourself? How would you like to introduce your country to our viewers? from your point of view and maybe attract them to visit it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. It's always a delight to be with you. Now I want to focus a little bit on Kenya and build from where you've left off. Indeed, Kenya is a land of growing opportunity with great potential for the future. Kenya, as you heard, got its independence in 1963 and has moved rapidly forward to become a hub for social development in East and Central Africa. It has had three phases of different leadership, and the current president is our third president since independence. One of his major achievements has been the promulgation of a new constitution. This new constitution brings a new face to the democratic order in Kenya. Our current leadership uh, paradigm is one of what we call a coalition government, where we have the president and a second principal, the prime minister. In the new constitution, what we have ensured is greater democracy, greater participation of the people. Our new constitution will provide for, in a manner of speaking, curtailing the presidential or executive power and authority. At the same time, it gives stronger arms of power to the legislature and the, exec and the judiciary with the executive. It also has a clause on devolution of power, so that we have set up 47 counties in Kenya. And at the county level, we affirm young people, women, and the disabled to ensure greater democratic participation of our people. This for us will be the way forward. The same constitution talks a lot about the Bill of Rights, ensuring rights for basic social services, 
The same constitution looks into other areas of governance like the provision of watchdog institutions. So the issues of corruption are of the past. We have a Kenya that will move forward now into what we call the middle level income based on a social plan that we call the Vision 2030. So I want to say our country is one which is moving very rapidly into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ambassador. And my next question would be a little bit about the international role Kenya has played. We know that Kenya has played an important role in brokering the peace and the situation in Sudan. It also seems to be a home of about 250,000 refugees from neighboring countries. So could you tell us about how does Kenya envisage its role in Africa and in the world? Thank you. Kenya continues to be a harbor for those who require solace and peace. And not just for Sudan and for Somalia, Kenya has also extended the same solid solace to Uganda and to Ethiopia at a particular time. Kenya has also been a place when there were problems in Rwanda and Burundi for their nationals. Indeed, we continue to have a concern for Sudan. We have had Sudanese uh, nationals live with us for almost 20 years. And we do have a great refugee population. We have camps on the northern border of Kenya, which have the Sudanese and also the Somalis. For us, we are happy to extend our territories to them when they need them. But we also have been supportive of governance arrangements that give stability. We are concerned that Somalia moves forward towards stability and that the young people of that country have a place in the economic development of their country. For Sudan, we continue to dialogue both with the governments of South Sudan and North Sudan so that institutions of lasting peace can be created for both the South Sudan and for the northern part of Sudan. We have a friendly uh, relationship with Uganda, with Rwanda, and with other countries of the region. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really encouraging. And congratulations on your work and the work of your country. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to touch again uh, at the topic of economics and the role that Kenya plays in Africa in general. Uh, we heard that it's one of the most powerful economical uh, forces in Africa. So uh, Margaret Hayward from the foundation has a question in that sense. Yes, hello, Ambassador. Uh, the economy of Kenya is largely reliant on production of primary goods. Uh, what efforts are presently being taken by the government to diversify the economy? All right, we have several efforts that the government is undertaking, but mostly to move from, like you've said, reliance on primary goods into what we call services. So right now, Kenya is focusing on, for example, ICT, and we want to become an ICT hub. And indeed, in this regard, we have landed uh, undersea cables. And from the region, Kenya is supplying a lot of the connectivity. We also are moving forward into tourism. But this has been a legacy, a heritage of Kenya. We're improving our touristic uh, attractions and reaching out to new markets on the issue of tourism. And we've actually come up with a tourism plan that has segmented our target audiences and is providing different packages for different targets. And with tourism, of course, comes hospitality. So for us, those are the major areas where we're moving forward. Beyond that, we also are looking into the financial services and we are growing our stock market so that within the region we have a very active hub for stock exchange. I think those are the primary areas where we see new growth in our country. But I want to say that new growth would not exist without the environment and infrastructure for the growth. This environment is being supported by laws and licensing that makes it easy for investment and support from the government for reduced taxes for those who are investing and for an investment climate that is supportive in the early years before break even. Beyond that, there's been a lot of investment into the infrastructure of the country so that services that are required can be easily accessed through better communication, better road infrastructure, and those now exist in the country. This all works together to produce a better environment for investment. We're also looking at new forms of energy so that we can bring down the cost of doing business by making sure that there's energy to power industry. Again, this is something that we're working very hard at. 
I think that goes into how we are going to support business. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a very clear strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we are looking at it as part of our national economic strategy, and I mentioned Vision 2030. Uh, Vision 2030 has um, put in place what we call the National Social and Economic Council in Kenya. And this council has an agenda for increasing Kenya's visibility for foreign direct investment. And I think you're aware, during the last month here in New York, we had a very frontal engagement with the business community of the Eastern Board at a Pan-African Investment Forum, actually hosted by Kenya and by an investor to our country. And our Prime Minister was the chief guest. So we're looking at including and encouraging external investors so that we improve our FDI. These, again, are part of our initiatives in terms of economic growth into the country. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Ambassador. So let's uh, tackle a little bit challenges that Kenya is facing along with many other countries in Africa and also in the world, environmental issues. Mm -hmm. We know that there is an issue of water pollution, water quality, deforestation, soil erosion, poaching. These are issues that many countries are facing right now and that have been aggravated by what we know as climate change. So I would like to invite Amy Rodriguez to make a question on that area. Thank you, Ms. Ambassador. We know that Kenya, like the rest of the world, is dealing with the negative effects of climate change, in particular land degradation, um, desertification, and deforestation. I was curious to know what actions the country is taking to reverse some of these effects. Thank you very much. A very, very interesting question. Indeed, uh, climate change is one of the major, major issues, both internationally and locally in Kenya. And we have a strategy at local level that is looking at mitigating the effects of climate change. I want to let you know that we are happy to report that within the last two years, our national leadership has addressed squarely the restoration of our water towers. Because of land degradation, we were about to lose our five major water towers. Mm -hmm. And this has been possible through a series of concerted public education campaigns. These campaigns are part of our national strategy for restoring the environment. And as a result, we have five water towers that have been restored. On the other hand, we continue to speak through agriculture about right land use and we continue to encourage our farmers, indeed, in the way they manage their land. Our programs include afforestation and reforestation, and we're very particular about the quality of forests that we grow. Um, beyond that, we're looking at the issue of human settlement, and we are looking to ensure that where we have to move people out of their normal settlement, that they are given alternative places to live, and that their welfare and their livelihoods are taken care of. Um, Kenya is indeed uh, a home for UN Habitat and for UNEP. And as a result, we are very, very aware about the green economy. And right now we're promoting growth in terms of employment opportunities that are green. We're looking at using th this opening, the opening of both those two UN headquarters to improve our engagement in terms of the green economy. I think that responds a little to your question. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. That you mentioned unemployment, it seems that the current government has inherited a very high rate of uh, unemployment, about 40 percent. So could you talk a little bit more about unemployment and, and what policies could be put in place? It could be a good lesson for other countries that are facing ever-growing problem of unemployment, even here in the United States, in the Dominican Republic, everywhere. Thank you very much. It's a very important question, particularly because you made reference to Kenya being a young population with a median age of about 18. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And also that we have a very short, in quotes, life expectancy. So what are we doing? I'd like to start from the fact that we're focusing on the informal sector. And we have a program in place in Kiswahili, my, la my national language is called Kazi Kwa Vijana. That means work for the young. And the government is providing a program where young people go out and do work to improve the environment, the infrastructure, and work in a manner of speaking to contribute back to their society. But that work is being remunerated. This is good for young people. It gives them a sense of patriotism, of nationhood, but a sense of being appreciated. At the same time, the government has put aside funding for what we call the Women's Enterprise Development Fund. This fund gives women some start-out or start-up money for small-scale business enterprise. 
It gives it to individuals and to women in groups and at incremental amounts. And as you know, when you have money at the domestic level in the hands of women, then the family's welfare is improved. Everything the, improves. Everything <laughs> improves. So there you are. We have this going, and this has been a tremendous gain for our government. But we also have a program of economic stimulus, stimulus given to many of the sectors of our economy. And this stimulus has gone into education and into agriculture and into the service and manufacturing parts of our economy. And when we give this stimulus, then indeed we increase the growth of those sectors. Those are ways in which our government is actually looking and tackling the issue of unemployment. We do also have, through our social program, some support for the elderly because we know at some point in time it's not possible to compete on the job market. Mm -hmm. So they're given a little package to take home so they don't remain as it were destitute or without any way to help and support themselves and are therefore not necessarily a burden on the younger population. Thank you so much. These are indeed great lessons for other countries as well. <laughs> Thank you. And the other serious issue that needs to be tackled and also in your country and worldwide and is one of uh, Millennium Development go Goals is of course AIDS. It seems <coughs> there have been uh, many, many deaths in 2009. Uh, the statistics state there were 80,000 people that died of AIDS. So um, <coughs> Terry Stefansik has a question in the area of health. <laughs> Ambassador, we know that combating HIV AIDS is an enormous challenge for <coughs> Kenya and for the international community. Could you um, <coughs> tell us, in your opinion, what you feel the national and the international community can do to scale up efforts are already underway? Thank you very much. Indeed, HIV AIDS is a major, major <coughs> scourge on the development of not only Kenya, but the developing world. And also, because we live together on one globe, continues to be a threat to the developed world. So it's a concern for all of us. When it comes to the international community, there is need to continue to give resources to programs on health and programs on HIV and AIDS. And that should be done by continued advocacy, such as here at the UN, where indeed we're going to soon have a high-level meeting on the issue of HIV and AIDS. And where should the money go? It should go towards behavior change communication, particularly targeting the most vulnerable who really need education. And therefore, it's important that we be frontal in our message and ensure that it goes to the right target audience. But we also need to talk about providing treatment and care as part of our strategy. In fact, as part of the most effective part of the strategy. And so the need to have antiretroviral drugs is important. Mm -hmm. And the drug companies, which are multinationals, need to be addressed on ensuring access to care for those who need it. And with the ARVs, we also need care given in terms of drugs for the other infections that these people suffer, because those living with HIV and AIDS are open to TB, malaria, <coughs> and other diseases, including fungal diseases. And so for those of us in the developing world, we need to be able to access these drugs through improved licensing and through the ability to manufacture at local level. I think those are the key strategies for outside. But when it comes to ourselves, it's important that we target the most vulnerable, that we have in place VCT centers, that we reduce stigma. And therefore, Kenya has done a lot in terms of reducing stigma. We have in place a law, a law against stigma for HIV and AIDS to increase uh, the people living with AIDS' ability to integrate, integrate in the job market and integrate within the community. Because indeed, with care, those are people who can live and become and continue to be productive. Mm -hmm. These are the areas, I think, of major concern. Thank you so much. And let's talk again about education, young people, future of the country. Mm -hmm. So Jamila Elsevio has a question in that area. Ms. Ambassador, the action on behalf of the Kenya government in 2003 to universalize the access to free primary education led to approximately a 70% 70, 70 increase of, uh, in primary school enrollment. Our efforts in the work to provide access to universal free secondary education as well do? Yes. <laughs> in fact, that was part of our president's rallying call during the elections. He spoke about his achievements and the achievement of the government for primary education, mm -hmm. and then was able to take off secondary education, and now we're moving towards university education. So I want to let you know the government of Kenya is actually paying for education of all secondary school students in public schools. So it exists. 
But more than that, right now, with the new constitution, in every county we have two national schools at secondary level. When I say national, <coughs> they are schools which have a certified standard that's national. They have a curriculum that's national. But these are schools at secondary, that give secondary level education. So in 47 counties, we have two schools, one for the girls and one for the boys. They're separate? Yes, separate schools. Mm -hmm. We also have centers of excellence within every county. Mm -hmm. So we will have, by 2012, 47 centers of excellence, and we'll have assured two schools in every one of the 47 counties. Those are our efforts. But we're also making efforts to ensure that with the schools, we also have teachers. And we're trying to have equity so that every region of our country has the same standard of education. So we're bridging the teacher-student ratio so that wherever you go in Kenya, you come up with one standard form of education and one quality student. Those are the efforts of our government. We believe in education. It's a mainstay. There is also informal education and education for elderly people, too. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ojambo, as a representative to the United Nations, you also preside the high-level committee on South-South cooperation. Uh, as you know, we as a foundation and our viewers as well are very interested in the work of the United Nations. Could you tell us about your work, about South-South cooperation, challenges and successes? Thank you very much. That's a lovely question and I'm delighted to respond. The high-level committee on South-South cooperation reports directly to the General Assembly. The General Assembly, as you know, is the largest or the highest and the most important decision-making organ of the United Nations. So we have a direct line reporting relationship to it. The high-level committee consists of Kenya as a president, but also has vice presidents from the regions of the Global South. This committee is supported by the work of the South-South Unit, the South-South Unit is a unit of UNDP, and within the unit there's a secretariat and a bureau. There have been a number of achievements, and I'd like to state in the very beginning that one of our greatest achievements has been the setting up of South-South News. South-South News has been able to broadcast a lot of the achievements of South-South Corporation. Now, what are the achievements? The achievements relate to the attainment of the Millennium Development Goals currently. And South-South Corporation is able to document, disseminate, and share so that countries can replicate the best practice in attaining the Millennium Development Goals. This wouldn't be possible without a tool such as South-South News that is able to bridge the digital divide and bring information about best practice across the Global South so that we are able to replicate what we've learned to be successes. There have been lots of successes in education, in health, in agriculture, in infrastructure, successes in democra demo democratization of the Global South too. Beyond that, we've been able to build a team of ambassadors for South-South Corporation. And South-South News has made it possible for these ambassadors to tour countries of the South and speak about issues of the South. I do recall a visit that we paid to China where we were able to visit Shanghai, we were able to visit Beijing, we were able to visit Hong Kong, and we set up an office of South-South News in that region. And this office continues to provide lessons and learning across the region. But more than that, during that visit, we visited the expo in Shanghai, where the ambassadors launched the UN part of the expo at the UN uh, stall within the Shanghai expo. And we spoke about uh, creating creative cities or having building creating creating new creating cities. Creating creative cities? Creating creative cities, that's right. Mm -hmm. Creating creative cities. And what was interesting about these creative cities is that we were able to talk about not only capturing the spirit of the city, but providing services that go onwards into the next century that are sensitive to the issues of the green economy, but provide basic services for all the social sectors. We were happy to be joined there by mayors from the provinces of China who are able to tell us how they are interacting with other countries of the Global South. It was a great learning, but it hasn't stopped there. We continue to tour the globe and to tour the Global South with the ambassadors. I'd like to also speak of a meeting that we held in Geneva on South-South Cooperation, where we spoke about employment and providing safe employment for those people coming from the Global South. Again, this is important. Employment opportunities are important for the Global South. 
But I'll move forward. We are thinking into the future about new things for South-South Corporation. We want to focus on connectivity. We want to utilize connectivity for health. And so telecommunication will continue to be a mainstay of our discussion. We're looking forward to bringing training skills to practitioners of the Global South and across the South to teleport this training so that we can improve the management of health. We have a number of things that we're going to do here at the UN. One, with the upcoming Youth Assembly. You've spoken about the needs for us to focus on the youth. The youth, education, and ICT. Not only here at the upcoming Youth Assembly, but into the future, we'll be having a meeting again in China to look at the issues of youth, ICT, and education. I could state more. We are going to do lots of work on the issue of women and women as they participate in the enterprise of business. And again, South South News is going to take a leadership in this very soon. This sounds wonderful, Mrs. Ambassador. Really, we can sense your dedication and your passion. Congratulations. Thank you. I'd like to say none of this has been possible or would have been possible without the charisma of those who are working within the projects. And particularly in South South News, we want to thank Ambassador Lorenzo for continuing to bring us together. I'd like to thank you also here for offering us this opportunity to engage on the issues of not only democratization, but the issues of tourism and national resources then each one of you and also the ambassadors who are absent but present with us in spirit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like Ambassador Lorenzo to address the issues of South-South Cooperation, South-South News, and uh, everything he has learned and enjoyed by working with Mrs. Ajambo. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. I think that the ambassador was very eloquent talking about the work not only of the South-South Unit at the United Nations, but as well as, of course, uh, Kenya is having the presidency of the General Assembly High Level Committee on South-South Cooperation. I think that we all have realized the importance of South-South in triangular uh, cooperation. But um, one thing that I would like probably maybe to ask you is, I know that you are not only an ambassador, you are not only the president of the General Assembly High Level Committee on South-South Cooperation, but you are also a doctor, you are a physician. <laughs> And uh, this week, uh, we're going to be having a meeting here at the United Nations, and it's going to be on HIV. I know the challenges, and I know that the question uh, was asked uh, before, but uh, can you probably maybe give us more details in terms of uh, what is going to be happening this week at the United Nations? I know that there are more than 10 head of state that are going to be coming, as well as, of course, all the high-level uh, people and ministers from health participating in this meeting. This meeting is very important because it's a review that we are having here, but probably maybe you can uh, enlighten us and give us more details about. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador. He's always good at getting the best of all of us, out of all of us. Um, yes, indeed, it's a very high-level meeting because we will have heads of state and, of course, uh, with them heads of government and also the ministers, ministers of health. And because HIV AIDS is a national concern, sometimes ministers of state because it usually finds itself in the office of the president as a program. And then beyond that, we're also going to have first ladies here and technicians from the ministries of health, the office of the president, and other places. So we will have very high level participation. And what are they here to do? They're here to come up with a political commitment, a political declaration on the way forward for HIV and AIDS. Because you know what? It's 30 years since the epidemic. The epidemic has turned 30. And although we are seeing a decline globally in the number of cases of HIV AIDS, we still have a number of people that have not been able to access care. There's still a large unmet need for HIV AIDS interventions. And these interventions are care, access to drugs and treatment, but also access to education. So these are the things that we want to address and redress, and we want to ask the global community not to turn away until indeed we have met with the needs to end the scourge of HIV and AIDS. So there will be a general debate going, but beyond that there will be side events. And the side events will be focusing on the issues of special groups, prison groups, refugee groups, the vulnerable, women and children, and other groups. And they will be attended by first ladies and others who are going to advocate on the issue of HIV and AIDS for those who most need it. On the other hand, the political declaration is going to talk about resources, and it's going to galvanize renewed funding for the fight against HIV. It's going to talk about sexual and reproductive health rights, and particularly the rights of women and the rights of persons in conflict. It's going to refer to international documents such as the ICPD, 
but also to the human rights issues around the issue of HIV and AIDS. He's going to talk about behavior and education, and he's going to look at new strategies for ensuring that the message actually goes out on the issue of HIV and AIDS. There are other concerns. There are concerns for travel around or across international boundaries. And some delegations are already raising a hue and cry about the need to restrict travel around HIV and AIDS. So I just want to let you know that there'll be a lot of discussion, but only to come up with a political declaration to continue the battle against HIV and AIDS. Thank you so much, Ambassador Jumbo. It's been a great pleasure to meet you, to speak with you, and to enjoy your knowledge, wisdom, and experience. Thank you so much for visiting us. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching the Global Roundtable, organized by South South News and the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Mm -hmm.